Good morning. I welcome you to worship here at the Greenbush Reformed Church. I'm Dave Jones, and I'm so happy to be able to spend this time with you. And that goes for not just those of you who are here present in the sanctuary, but also those of you who are joining us via our video. Um, a few announcements before we begin. Um, there are a few new ones. Let's see, again, my ongoing thanks for your incredible support of our congregation. We continue to hold on. Um, much thanks to your care and graciousness and devotion to our congregation. Um, as I've mentioned, our uh, <clears throat> internet system, as well as our phones actually, has changed. But with that, our Wi-Fi connection has changed. If you're trying to connect to the Wi-Fi, um, there's a new password for that, and you can find that in your bulletin. We have decided that we'll return to our 10, 10 a.m. normal worship hour uh, the first Sunday in October, which is October 4th. So we'll be returning to our 10, 10 a.m. worship service then. Um, also, um, Anyone, uh, including those who are joining us vid via video, we do now have actually four iPads that um, people can borrow if they'd like, if they are, do not have access to um, something that they can watch the recorded service on and are watching it at home. If you are interested in that, um, you can contact Lynn Morse. Her uh, contact information is in your bulletin um, and we can help you with that. Um, let's see, Doors of Hope Food Pantry is reopened, and uh, if you'd like to bring food to put in our basket, it's now in the lounge because we needed more room in the uh, foyer area, uh, but the basket is in our lounge. If you'd like to bring food, we'll get it to them, uh, thanks to Chris over there. Um, so uh, we're resuming that. If you have clothing or other thrift shop type items that you'd like to um, bring them. Their address is in your bulletin, and you can do that. The Book of Psalms study has gone really well that Nancy put together. It was an uh, email study, uh, but it has come to an end, so I need to remove that announcement in there, but uh, uh, it went really well, and uh, thank you for Nancy to doing it and for all the participants that were part of it. This coming Tuesday, um, will probably be our last session of Hope for Hard Times. Again, we've been doing that via Zoom, um, and this Tuesday it will take place at 7 p.m. for those of you who've been part of that. And if you'd like to join us for the last session, you'd probably get something out of it, so you're more than welcome to come and join us. Just let me know so I can send you the Zoom connection. And I think that's it. So, let us worship God. Beloved, this is the day that God has made for us, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd be grateful if you join me in the bidding words that are in your bulletin. Come, let us worship God, the one who caused the sea to part, opening a path to safety, the one in whose presence the mountains and hills skip. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Almighty. Sing praise to the one who turns rock into pools of water and flint into springs. Come, let us worship God.
As we begin worship, I invite you to join me in taking a moment of assessing those places in our lives that need God's mercy and grace. Let us do so knowing that God is ready and wanting to offer it. Our prayer of confession is printed in our bulletins, and I invite you to join me. Peace be with you, and also with you. When we participate in those things that hurt others, even as we seek healing for ourselves, forgive us, O God. When we ignore voices that don't agree with us, even as we want others to listen to us, forgive us, O God. When we quietly or not so quietly rejoice in violence or the ruin of enemies or the hurt of one who hurts, forgive us, O God. When we cannot find within us the capacity to forgive others while we hope for forgiveness of ourselves, stay by our side, O God, in our struggle. O God, teach us how to trust in your power more than our own. Amen. And the good news, beloved friends, is that God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Therefore, it's my joy to declare to you that in the name of the living Christ, our sins are forgiven. Believe this good news and live in its peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture text for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. I'll be reading from the 18th chapter, beginning at the 21st verse, and I invite you to listen as I share with you God's word. So then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. Now when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God bless this reading of his word. Amen. popular genre of cartoons and jokes is that of St. Peter, or sometimes it's even God, sitting at a desk at the entrance of heaven's pearly gates, evaluating heaven's new arrivals to see if they're worthy of entrance. One recent one I saw had Peter sitting there with an infrared thermometer pointing it at people's foreheads as they came in. Another cartoon shows St. Peter's in front of two entrances. 
One for those who were pre-authorized and another for everyone else. There's also a cartoon of St. Peter telling a nervous candidate that her username and password did not match his records. She'll have to try again. In another, St. Peter tests someone by saying, okay, one last time, give me another word for thesaurus. As funny as these cartoons can be, it is a revealing look at how we often view heaven and God. There is no free ride. There will be a test. While it's certainly not the pearly gates, there is a lot of that kind of evaluation going on these days. It's necessary, of course. It's important, and it's for everyone's safety. But almost everywhere we go, there's an entrance requirement, even here at our church. As soon as we walk in the door, an infrared thermometer is pointed at our foreheads. If it's somewhere between being alive and 100 degrees, we're okay. We can come in. At the entrance of Home Depot, a person stands at the door keeping tabs of the number of people who are in the store. If the allowed capacity is reached, then everyone has to wait until someone comes out. A couple of weeks ago, I received a call from my doctor's office regarding an appointment I had for the next day. In order for me to be able to keep that appointment, I needed to answer a bunch of screening questions we are all well familiar with. Have you traveled within the last 14 days? Have you knowingly been in contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19, etc.? Answering yes to any of these questions means I can't go. All of this is quite necessary, of course. It's our communal effort at trying to keep a deadly enemy at bay. In fact, what makes me nervous these days are those places that don't take that evaluative process seriously. Having said that, though, I can't tell you the number of times I have felt bad because of the loss of all those familiar tools I used for greeting people no more handshakes, no more hugs, forced to keep my distance. I can't even show my smile with a mat because of the mask I wear. Recently, we met my brother and his new wife for lunch. It was really the first chance we had to get to know her a little bit. All during our time together, we stayed outside, we kept our distance, and we wore a mask when we weren't eating. When we left, all I could do was wave goodbye instead of hugging my brother as I've always done. To me, it felt like a reprimand, the kind of behavior one exhibits as a form of disappointment, so-called cold shoulder. There is surely a lot of grace that we need to extend to each other in these cruel days. Patience, understanding, an extra heap of kindness, and empathy. Truth is, it's tough on all of us. Perhaps this fact might even give us a little deeper insight into today's passage. Lord, Peter says, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Seven times, maybe? Peter's question actually suggests that he had a fairly good understanding of who Jesus is is by now. Normally, according to law, one only needs to forgive three times. That's it. Peter, knowing that Jesus was the forgiving sort, he plays it safe. He expands it to seven times. Surely Jesus would not argue with such a a generous amount of mercy. Well, Jesus does. Not seven Jesus says, but 77 times, or seven times, 70 times, as it says in some other texts. Essentially, what Jesus is telling Peter is that one just never stops forgiving. There is no limit. One does not do any of the kind of counting they do at the doors of Home Depot. In math terms, the real number that one must use is a symbol 
that indicates infinity, a sideways eight. It's in your bulletin if you've never seen one. A more prevalent image of God is quite the opposite, however. I hear it all the time. What does one need to do to stay on God's good side? Is the bad that's happening to me a sign of God punishing me for something? How good do I need to be to be assured a place in God's heavenly abode? How many points must I earn to get past that big security guard in the sky? Our relationship with God often tends to be reduced to a business transaction. This for that. Even though there is no other place in all of our lives that talks about mercy and forgiveness more than the church, when push comes to shove, the power play of who gets in and who doesn't still rises to the surface. I think if there's one thing that must make God weep, it must be this. So Jesus tells a story. It starts in a lighthearted manner. It has almost a stand-up comic feel to it. So, there's this guy. He owes the king 10,000 talents. Now, I know jokes that need explaining aren't very good jokes, but I do need to give you a little insight here. The 10,000 talents this guy owes the king is an absolutely absurd and ridiculous amount. It's a little like me going to the Bank of Green County and asking them for a two trillion dollar loan. Even though I know Betsy Darrow who works there, they probably wouldn't even give it to me. In fact, they probably laughed their heads off at me. They're probably rolling on the floor in laughter. Now add to the fact that this guy is not a wealthy business tycoon. He's a servant of the king. How does a servant rack up this much debt? I'd love to know what credit cards he had. The joke continues by then having the king demand repayment of the loan for the servant. Now, it's bad enough that the king gave this guy all this money, but to expect that he could pay it back is pretty funny, too. And by now, the folks listening to this story would have been audibly chuckling. This is actually quite a funny setup. We certainly can't accuse Jesus of not having a sense of humor. Jesus continues. The king ends up having pity on this poor servant that owes him money, more money than the treasury can print. So he forgives the entire debt. Did you hear that? The entire debt. Thing. He doesn't make a request for small payments. He doesn't reduce the debt to something the servant could manage. He goes from threatening to sell his whole family off as slaves to him owing absolutely nothing. He writes everything off, every single penny of it. The servant ends up owing the king nothing. Now, by now, The folks in the audience must have been holding their sides from laughing so hard because who in the world does this? I mean, what kind of idiot is this king? Maybe we should try selling this guy the Brooklyn Bridge. As they try to catch their breath from laughing so hard, I wonder if anyone really heard the next part of the story. This servant, forgiven more money than Bill Gates has, leaves the king's court without showing an ounce of gratitude. Not an ounce. The enormity of the gift that he's just been given doesn't even seem to register with him. You would think this guy would be in shock, stunned, utterly overcome by what he just experienced. An unexpected, undeserved gift that he couldn't possibly Match and return. In the first church I served, just a year or so out of seminary, our car bit the dust. We had to get a new one. We didn't have two nickels to rub together. My in-laws were kind enough to give us a loan for a new car with monthly payments that we could afford. 
It would take a long time for us to pay them back, but at least we had transportation. We had a car. Well, that Christmas, we received a card from them saying the loan was forgiven. Merry Christmas. Well, my jaw dropped. I didn't know what to say. Relief washed over me like a warm shower on a cold day. I just couldn't believe they did that. The significance of that gift was probably something more than they even could realize. To this day, I still remember that moment with gratitude. You would think we would see something like this in the servant that had just been forgiven a debt far larger than we can even wrap our heads around. But not only do we sense not even a bit of gratitude, but before the door even shuts behind him as he leaves the king's court, he encounters someone who owes him a minuscule amount of money compared to the debt he's just been forgiven. He grabs the guy by the throat. He makes all kinds of threats and ultimatums, and then finally throws the guy into jail despite the poor guy's desperate pleas for mercy, not unlike the kind of desperate pleas he made to the king. Well, the king gets wind of this, and the first servant's lack of transformation leads to a revocation of the mercy that, God, that, that the king originally extended. We talk a lot about forgiveness, mercy, and grace in the church, maybe more than any other place in society. And in the midst of it all, just about every single one of us can come up with a story or two, an experience or an event that we've been part of where grace and mercy just doesn't make any sense or might not even seem very wise. We tend to have one reason or another to explain why it's a bad idea and we should give it a pass. Story after story that's hard to refute that makes perfect sense in this power play society of ours where we lift ourselves up by putting others down. Where we are experts at coming up with reasons why we don't need to be or can't be as gracious as the king in this story. I mean, after all, he was a fool. By doing that, I think we miss the point of the story. Because in the end, what the story really asks of us is this. Do we get it? Do we really get what this first servant did not get? In fact, the harshness of how the king treated this first servant when he found out he didn't get it is probably indicative of the importance that Jesus placed on the point of this story. The big question is, have we allowed the magnitude of God's mercy towards us not towards everyone else, towards us, to sink in, to really sink in. Has, and as a result, has it left our mouths gaping in amazement? Do we really, are we dumbfounded by finding out that, oh my gosh, we really are loved that much, that profoundly, that completely, by God? Do we get that when we go to the gates of heaven, there's going to be no sentry? Because if there were, who among us would pass muster to get in? There is no heavenly scorecard being kept, because if there were, who among us would ever garner enough points? Do we, do I, do you, do we get that? Do we really get that? All this societal 
power play stuff that we do just doesn't exist in the courts of God. And as such, it is impossible for one to walk into the courts of God and come out the same person that we were when we went in. When we truly feel the full weight of this gift, transformation is the result. And finding ways to pay it forward, it becomes our life's mission. We can't notice the world's sin without also remembering the log that has been removed from our own eye. If what we experience in the king's court and God's court doesn't change us, if it doesn't change who I am, who you are, who we are, then we're not getting it. Just like the server servant didn't get it. It's as easy as that. You know, way back before I went to seminary, I heard this illustration that has kind of stuck with me ever since. I need to emphasize, it is a story that is not in the Bible. It is not in the Bible. But it is, I think, a fair illustration of the message that God tries to convey to us. After the ascension, the angels came to Jesus asking him what his backup plan was. Yes, this whole cross thing and this Easter thing and this grace thing was pretty amazing stuff, but they were sorely skeptical that it would actually work in the end. So they wanted to know what they needed to do to prepare next, prepare for next. Well, Jesus looked up at them and simply said, there's no backup plan. God alone be all the glory. Amen. Before we take a moment for prayer, I invite you to consider those in our prayer list, um, which is found on page two, about halfway down. Um, I must say I did uh, talk to, actually I emailed, had some email exchange with Krista Block this week. Bill de Block sadly is not doing well. The latest chemo he uh, had undertake just had so many nasty side effects for him they had to stop it. Um, so he's just not doing well and uh, which breaks my heart and I know yours too so Please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. And you know, if you get a chance to send him a card, those things have meant the world to him, I gotta tell you. So if you get a chance to send a card, that would be great. Um, I think that's the only real update I have. Yeah. Um, and then I did receive a prayer concern from my little cards in the back. Um, a reminder to keep uh, students and teachers and administrators and parents in our prayers as a school year somehow shakily starts again. Um, and we are all anxious about that, I know, and keeping our ears to the news as we await the latest. So lots of prayers for all those wonderful people and all the anxiety that must be coursing through their veins. So with that, I'd be so incredibly grateful if you join me in a time of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Loving God of grace greater than we can comprehend, mercy wider than we can see, and love deeper than the ocean, we come to you humbled by the liberation you have made possible for us. Difficult though it is to understand and even believe you have loved and forgiven us so 
that we might discover who and what you have created us to be. So our simple prayer this day, O oh God, is that we might truly get it. We might get the significance of what this gift means to us. We pray that its truth might sink deep within us. We pray that we, it might slowly do its work of changing us, recreating us, enabling us to find our better selves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for these, this day for those whose hearts are hardened by the world's bitter ways. We pray for those who are so broken they cannot see beyond their hurt. We pray for those so wounded they feel little beyond their own pain. We pray for those so pushed down they find it nearly impossible to rise up. We pray for those who have heard they are junk so often they have come to believe it and even live it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this day for ears to hear, for eyes to see, for hearts and minds able to genuinely believe that we are forgiven and loved. We pray that this revelation will change who we are and how we live in this world. We pray that we might become agents of the grace we have received. We pray, we pray that this grace might become contagious and widespread. We especially pray for leaders around the world. We pray for our president, congressional leaders and their staff. We pray for state governments, including our governor and assembly. We pray for all those in positions of influence and power. We pray for the least among us and those who minister to them. We pray for those who reveal the best in us by way of their selfless sacrifices. We pray, O oh Lord, for all who are involved in our school systems, for teachers and students and parents and administrators, bus drivers, for everyone who is feeling the anxiety of trying to return to some kind of norm in these difficult days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are ill, weary, lonely, isolated, troubled, grieving, and hurting. We also pray that you might hear and respond to these prayers that we now name in our silence or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask all this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I lost my bulletin. <laughs> ah, addiction. Um, please, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to say this, but I won't be able to greet you in the back. I wish I could. As I mentioned in my sermon, this is a hard part for me. Um, not being able to do that, but we need to keep safe. And I also ask you as you leave to be mindful of keeping physical distance as you exit the building. God bless you all. And stay safe. Don't panic. And above all else, remember that you are a child of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.